još jednom samo da se upoznamo. Ja sam Mišo Kapetanović sa Centra za napredne studije sveučilišta u Rijeci i pozdravljam vas na četvrtom danu našeg simpozijuma. Ovaj program koji vidite, malo ćemo raditi izmjenjeno. Should I wait for English? Ovaj program koji vidite, radit ćemo malo izmjenjeno zato što Daniela mora da ide u jednom trenutku, tako da ćemo imati prvo Danielu Majstorović, onda Korniliju Krabener i nakon toga Roberta Van Helpena. A ću samo sačekati možda da se... Okay, or maybe just to give a short introduction for Daniela in English, but Daniela's presentation is going to be in Serbo-Croatian, so it might be a good idea to get the headphones on. Uh, well, no, no, just, I, I wanted to wait, but... Okay, so Daniela Storovic is a professor at the Department of English Literature and Language at the University of Panja Luka. She is also activist and filmmaker. Uh, her last book, I'm, I'm going to skip only to the last one, uh, that also is part of the conversation that we are going to have today, is... Um, sorry, can you... Uh, which one? The youth, state, and ethnic identities, uh, social science approaches. That's a book that came out for Paul Grave. And then yeah, this course is, is a periphery by the city. This, yeah. Exactly. But today she's going to speak to us about the Anti-Fascist Front of Women, which is a collaborative project that worked together with the organization Crvena or Red mm -hmm. from Sarajevo. Daniela, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm just going to make a brief intro in English, and I'll switch to server creation uh, for the reasons, the reasons for it that are, are uh, that the translation of the, of the poems that I'm using uh, are going to be done literally in like two weeks, and I don't want to experiment. Um, so, yeah, I'll just switch to English, but we can have a discussion, uh, to, to server creation, we can have a discussion in English. Uh, uh, mi se hvala vam svima, dobro jutro, <laughs> vjerovatno se svi razbuđujemo od juče. Um, meni je prvenstveno bila zanimljiva ova konferencija zbog svog naslova, je li svjedečanstvo, uh, poezija, jezik i tog odnosa pojmova testimony i testament, uh, svjedočanstvo i zavještanje koju, ostavi, koju zapravo imaju sličnu osnovu. Uh, I uh, razmišljala sam, da, i pogotovo o truth or politics, mene je to po, uh, podsjetilo ono truth or dare, jeli, uh, onu igru uh, jeli, koja se igra u Americi, Britaniji i slično. Uh, I taj moment istine arhiva, teksta, dakle ja ne radim samo sa poetskim tekstom, radim sa više tekstova, uh, mislim moj neki background je kritička analiza diskursa, Uh, I zapravo se bavim problemom, mislim da više u ovoj tr transdisciplinarnosti, a transdisciplinarnosti uh, je ono, for better or for worse, <laughs> obilježi ovu konferenciju, jer zaista dolazimo svi iz različitih disciplina i svi na različite načine tretiramo ovaj, uh, pojmove i svjedočanstva, i jezika, uh, i poezije, i zato je uh, možda zgodno ove naše duge pauze za kafu, možda su upravo one zgodne da te neke stvari ispeglamo, jer mislim da zaista je riječ o jednoj, uh, pa, jednom sazvuću više glasova, što je netipično za mnoge konferencije, to je ono što čini ovu konferenciju jedinstveno. Dakle, moj naslov mog rada nosi naziv stvaranje nove jugoslovenske žene, emancipatorske elementi medijskog diskursa, ali ne samo medijskog, rada drugog svjetskog rata. I nekoliko stvari o stvaranju te nove jugoslovenske žene. Znači, naravno da su postoje ženski pokret u Jugoslavi prije drugog svjetskog rata, međutim, drugi svjetski rat je o ja se baš bavim godinama 45-46. Zanimljiv zato što se vrlo jasno iz onog dostupnog propagandnog materijala, evo konkretno novine Nova, Naša žena, a ne samo Naša žena, iako je to bio moj primarni korpus, već i glas i žena u borbi, primjećuje zaista jedno stvara, jedno konstruisanje, da kažem, tog novog identiteta nove jugoslovenske žene koji je prekretnica u smislu da se upravo tad kao što smo juče na promociji ove knjige govorili dešava taj jedan kvantni skok za najširi broj žena u Jugoslaviji i ta nova jugoslovenska žena naravno je po puno stvari bila nova, ali ja izdvajam tri posebna elementa koje su mi bile interesantne i na koje sam naišla u svom korpusu, a to je taj moment internacionalizacije, znači kada jugoslovenke afežeovke ravnopravno učestvuju sa svojim sagovornicama iz Sovjetskog saveza, Sjedinjenih država, Polje, 
vojske, Kambodže i tako dalje. To je jedan moment, drugi moment je uloga AFEŽ, odnosno AFEŽ-ovki i taj sam proces konstruisanja u borbi protiv fašizma i u stvorenju ravnopravnosti, znači gdje je ustavom iz 46. ženi u Slovenki dato po prvi put pravo i razvoda i staranja, znači samohrana majka je priznata, da kažem, Pa vidjet ćete tu, tu Kardelj kaže da je o podizanje djece previše ozbiljna stvar, da se o njoj ne bi kao brinula država. Zatim, ono što mi je posebno važno kada govorim iz pozicije nekog ko živi u post-Dejtonskoj, post-ratnoj BiH, taj zavnobiški moment interpeliranja, simultanog zazivanja, tu srpkinje Hrvatice i muslimanke, koji zapravo treba da sve te identitete nekako podvede pod identitet Jugoslovenki, vidjet ćete u kakvim i tekstovima i kako se to dešava. I naravno, posljednja, ali ne i najmanje važnu ulogu AFEŽ-a u procesu najmasovnijeg opšteg obrazovanja žena na ovim prostorima. Znači, vidjet ćete kroz kakve metafore, recimo, se govori o nepismenosti. E sad, gdje je taj moment zapravo svidočanstva ili testamenta? Znači, danas... Žene na Ljevici puno, puno pričaju o tom afežeu, priča se o tome šta se radi danas, koji su, imali smo drugcu ženu prije 40 godina sa čuvenim proleteri Kovan Pere Čarape, taj moment gdje je feminizam u Jugoslavi počinje propitivati neke odnose nejednakosti koji su tad postojali, dakle, prije 40 godina. Zatim imamo tu čitavu priču o repatriarchalizaciji, retradicionalizaciji koja dolazi s ratovima 90-ih. I mene je zanimalo, ok, kako i na koji način odnos testament testimony može da doprinese onome što Gadamir zove horizont für Schmeldung u tom spajanju, stapanju horizonata koji nam je potreban da bismo napravili, da bismo možda preveli to vrijeme u današnje vrijeme. Recimo kad čitamo brojne tekstove, evo ovdje su neki drugari, koji su se bavili pručavanjem teksta Mlade Bosne, Veselina Maslaša, mi nalazimo i dalje ehoje i odjeke tih tekstova u današnjici. E sad, ove četiri stvari koje sam navela, dakle, međunarodni kontekst, borba protiv fašizma, osvarivanje ravnopravnosti, opismenjavanje i to kreiranje te nadnacionalne žene Jugoslovenke, samo pritom mala fusnota, ne možemo da kažemo da su to je sad za debatu, da li su dakle formirane već bile nacije pred drugi svjetski rat, jer kod nas tu dolazi do brojnih preklapanja da ćete vi čuti da se govori o bosanskim pravoslavcima, a ne o srbima u Bosni i Hercegovini, ili o katolicima, ne o bosanskih hrvatima, tako da to je jedna tema za drugu, ja sam uzela, vodila sam se tekstom, znači stvarno se u tekstu spominju srpkinje, hrvatice, muslimanke, I ja sam shodno tome analizirala ove reprezentacije. E sad, to čitam, s obzirom na današnji trenutak, znači te govore, tekstove i sve što je izašlo, radi, pokušaj da se uspostavi ta neka arhivska veza, taj arhiv koji je zapravo budućnost, kako Derida govori, sa onim što je danas, recimo, što razara, što boli, što nas trga, a to je periferni status društava naspad BiH, društva zapravo se bavim Bosnom i Hercegovinom, ali mislim da su stvari slične i u Srbiji i u Hrvatskoj, u odnosu na zemlje u procesu evropeizacije, nedostatak internacionalizacije, što utiče na samjerljivost i vidljivo socijalni zahtjeva koji dolaze sa periferije ili poluperiferije, mada nas evo sad zovu u savremenoj političkoj teoriji periferijom periferije, odnosno super periferijom, to su novi, Izrazi, jeli, zatim dva, u nedovoljnoj kolektivnoj mobilizaciji žena u novoj postsocialističkoj državi, uprkos proliferaciji identitarni politika, politika identiteta i rodno mainstreamingu koji promoviše liberalne ideje ženskih ljudskih prava, individualizam i preduzetništvo, a zanemaruje, na primjer, ili potpuno ne vidi prava radnica i nezaposlenih. Pod tri, nemanju jasnog odnosa, dakle, taj odnos se, rekla bih, artikuliše kroz ne znam, neke feminističke organizacije ili neke pokrete koji su nastali nakon februarske protesta 2014. ali mislim da i dalje riječ o nedovoljnoj, nedovoljno artikulisanom odnosu prema fašistoidnim politikama, jer mi zapravo imamo jedino te etno politika je the only politics in town, uslijed dejtonski ugrađenih nacionalizam, potpirivanih kroz antijugoslovenstvo i antikomunizam koji maskiraju odnose nejednakosti uslovljene 
autoritarnim kapitalizmom nove postsocialističke države, a kojima je Balkanski patrijarhat prirodni saveznik, dakle tu govorimo o postsocialističkoj repatrijarhalizaciji. I pod četiri nepismenosti koje i danas vlada, znači vi danas u Bosni i Hercegovini prema rezultatima popisa iz 2013. imate 77.000 nepismenih žena. Dakle, mi nepismeno zapravo nismo dokinuli. I evo ja ću početi sa nekoliko uvida koji su meni bili zanimljivi. Meni je recimo posebno bio zanimljiv i ovo je divna prilika da imam vrijeme da govorim o tom svom ulazku u arhiv, jer je to prvi put da sam se bavila arhivom, dakle Crvena je digitalizovala dostupne materijale, brojne kutije iz Istorijskog muzeja u Sarajevu i nekih drugih muzeja i obavili su jedan taj zaista teguben rad katalogizacije i digitalizacije, tako da smo mi svi imali priliku da iz naših toplih soba pristupimo tom zaista fascinantnom arhivu i da pokušamo ispraviti tu izbrisanost AFŽ-a i ne samo ispraviti to, već djelovati kao neki korektiv, već zaista pokušati spojiti horizonte i vidjeti šta nama danas AFŽ znači, šta nam radi, možemo li i šta možemo iskoristiti iz tog čitavog, da kažem, korpusa. Dakle, evo spomenut ću banjalučkog pjesnika Dragana Studena, dok čije sam zbirke Borkinje, zbirka njegove se zove Borkinje, izašla je 1982. i tad Dragan Studen, on piše na ekavici i on se stavlja u poziciju Borkinje i Afeželke, partizanke žene. Vrlo neobično, pričali smo o multiperspektivnosti poezije juče. I u prvoj pjesmi te zbirke on progovara kao žena, Borkinja, ratnica koja se obraća nama u budućnosti. Dakle, godina je 82. I evo ja ću pročitati tu pjesmu. Beležit ćemo ugljenom oživeti žar i biti zapamćeni. Uđemo li u sliku na zidu obešenu, samo sebi bit ćemo slični. Nećemo prestati zemlju iz rova da izbacujemo, da nas ne zatrpa. Vreme zgusnuto na kriške seći ćemo, a nož beznadežan izgoreće u jezgru. Uđemo li u sliku na zidu obešenu, tu ostaćemo za vek na vek. Ona, dakle, pišući o iskustvu žene u drugom svjetskom ratu 40. godina kasnije, također podsjeća da nam je u zlu izlaz, a opstanak u propasti, nagovištavajući da se upravo u lomovima svjetske istorije išlo u borbu i smrt da bi se živjeti moglo. Tako da, meni je posebno zanimljivo da kažem da otvorim sa ovim, jer i za mene ta pjesma neki način simbolizuje taj ulazak u arhiv i taj moment odnosa prema vremenu, prema tome da budeš nekakva slika, uđemo li u sliku na zidu obešenu tu ostaćemo za vek na vek mi zapravo ne bismo trebali ući u sliku već biti nešto drugo ako je smisao arhivskog istraživanja u prošlosti pronaći življeno iskustvo kako bi se danas pokazalo da ovo što znamo kako govorimo i djelujemo nije od uvijek ni za uvijek i da se jednako tako može biti promjenjeno onda arhiv nisu svi sačuvani tekstovi jer je arhiv zapravo istorijski okvir za uslov nekog iskaza Reaktivacija prošlih iskaza može da ponudi smjernice da se preko prošlosti probamo osloboditi zarobljenosti u sobstvenom arhivu, kako kaže Foucault, koji ne možemo opisati. Kako bismo mogli drugačije misliti i djelovati u današnjem trenutku? Namira nije da se uspostavi ono što su ljudi u trenutku nekog govora mogli da misle, smjeraju, iskušavaju, žele, već da se analiziranom diskursu pridružimo u identitetu razumijevši ga kroz ponovno pisanje, to jest uređeni preobražaj onoga što je već napisano. Kraj citata. Susret ženskih borbi u dva istorijska trenutka, onom prije 70. kusur godina i ovom današnjem, neophodan je ne samo za borbu protiv istorijskog revizionizma, već i za mišljenje novog političkog djelovanja ka jednakosti za sve. Kriza koju živimo slično je onoj 30. i 40. godina prošlog vijeka, budući da se kroz procese njihove restauracije i rehabilitacije ponovo dovode u vezu kapitalizam, fašizam i poras neravnopravnosti. Mada sam se, dakle, u toku istraživanja, naravno, AFŽ je crpio svoju snagu iz nekih drugih pokreta, pogotovo Španskog građanskog rata, i to i Cana Babović kaže, jeli, vidimo da ona spominje, jeli, na prvoj zemaljskoj konferenciji AFŽ-a, da je, šta je zapravo bila, da kažem, inspiracija. I tamo negdje već, dakle, 45. kreće, da sad tu malo skratim, jel, dolazimo do tog časopisa Nova žena, koji je prvi zapravo medij za žene u ratnoj i poslije ratnoj Bosni i Hercegovini, I kao propagandno oružje AFŽ komunističke partije, osim pretplate i članarina, časopis se, vjerovali ili ne, finansirao i štampao 
i kroz prodaju skupljenih krpa željezari. Znači, to je bila politička ekonomija, nije samo neko dao pare, zapravo svi su učestvovali u produkciji i nalaženju novca za taj časopis. Kako bi se on, dakle, distribuirao ženama u selima i gradovima BiH, u svrhe opismenjavanja, u svrhe da se žene privuku radu i zadacima ove organizacije. List je, tiraž lista je bio oko 10.000 primjera u 46. a već u julu 47. ima 22.000 primjeraka. Iako koncentrisana na kratak vremenski period samo kraja rata, odnosno početka mirnodopskog perioda, analiza predstavljena ima za cilj da prateći 15-ak, ja sam zapravo radila analizu 15-ak tih časopisa, da opiše kako ova nova jugoslovenska žena dakle biva konstituisana i da uvidi poveznice između istorijskih uvida sa današnjim životom u takozvanoj pustinji posocijalizma. I šta je to u njima bilo emancipatorsko, šta je to u njima bilo nešto što se može i danas koristiti. Već na prvi pogled, znači, žena se tu u listu nova žena, one se zazivaju kao ravnopravni subjekti, one su borkinje, bolničarke, ratnice, narodnih heroja, ne pasivne promatračice. Međutim, upravo će Milka Kufrin kasnije reći, i to sam potvrdila u nekim uspjenim istorijama sa ženama, preživilim ženama, afeševkama i partizankama, da je jednakost postojila samo u četi. Dakle, da sve ono što je došlo kasnije, jer i u samom tom zborniku postoji jedna velika kontroverza, znači zapravo šta nam je to socijalizam donio, šta nam je odnio. Imamo podatke da je ukupan broj zaposlenih žena bio 90.000 u BiH, nakon 40.000 kad poredimo rezultate popisa 31. i 51. dok u radu ti je neokvična primjer, ona se poziva na Susan Woodward i Jane Humphreys, gdje kaže da se ukupan udio zaposleni žena povećao samo za 3%. I da mi ne bismo, mislim, priča o udjelu i o, to su relativne vrijednosti, postoje apsolutne, ali svakako bi to poslužilo koja je na matrica da mi danas 40 godina kasnije zapravo raspravljamo o ženama i socijalizmu. Publika je takva, a i naziv konferencije je takav, ja bi sad malo pričam o arhivu i zbog čega arhiv. Dakle, ovako, diskursivno-istorijski metod, znači unutar CDA metodologije, unutar metodologije kritičke analize diskursa, dakle, identitete vidi ne kao nešto fiksno, već kao kontekstualno zavisne i dinamične momente koji se konstruišu, perpetuiraju, dekonstruišu unutar nekog diskursa, te u skladu s tim po primjeru različite oblike. I on je politički, on već ima projekat socijalne promjene. Znači, CDA je u samom startu posvećena, da kažem, društvenoj promjeni. I ja sam se tu bavila analizama argumentativnih strategija, toposa, metafora, poređenja i tako dalje. A diskursivnu istorijsku analizu također metodološki posmatram u tradiciji Raymonda Williamsa, znači koji kaže da kad danas pričamo o tradiciji, dakle naša sadašnjica danas vrvi o tradicije, mi ne možemo nego da živimo tu tradiciju, ona je svugdje oko nas, ali u toj tradiciji naravno afežeja nema, nije ga bilo nešto bog zna šta ni 80-ih ni 70-ih. I u tom smislu koristan je kulturno-materialistički uvid da je tradicija element koji omogućuje zapravo kontinuitet prošlosti i sadašnjosti, ali da je ona kombinacija namjerno selektivne verzije prošlosti koja se uobličava i uobličene sadašnjosti koja onda moćno djeluje u procesima društvenog i kulturnog definisanja i identifikovanja. Dakle, neke prakse bivaju isključene na uštrb drugih. Kad je riječ o ovim diskursima, meni je zaista bio veoma koristan Gadamerom uvida što je komplikovaniji sadržaj koji treba da shvatimo, to više pojedinočnih elemenata postaje relevantnima, a time širi i bogatiji mora biti horizont shvatanja. Ulazak u arhiv iz perioda drugog svjetskog rata važan je kako zarad sticanja tih transgeneracijskih uvida u prošlost bosansko-hercegovačke i jugoslovenskih žena tog perioda, Tako i zbog sagledavanja interpretativne produktivnosti s obzirom na današnje probleme s kojima se žene u BiH susreću. I samo tada može se uslovno govoriti o stapanju ovih horizonata koje omogućuju aktualizaciju benjaminovske istoriografije podjarmljenih gdje u svjetlu iskustva sa prošlošću djelujući borbena podjarmljena glasa piše istoriju za sebe. Upravo ova podjarmljenost ostaje konstanta kad je riječ o mišljenju i djelovanju nakon iskustva rata i poraća kao gubitka siromaštva, periferalnosti, nacionalizma, nezaposlenosti, prekarnosti i nepismenosti koji obstaju sve do danas. Svi skupa dodatno onemogućavaju organizovanje žena ali muškaraca da promijene svoj društveni položaj doprinoseći stvaranju te podjarmljene klase koja svoju borbenost gubi u nemogućnosti da artikuliše sobstvenu poziciju podčinjenog. 
Znanja o AFEŽ-u su u ovom smislu ključna za transistorijsko stapalje horizonata, jer nose potencijal za mišljenja drugačijeg svijeta i borbe, upravo jer su ovu poziciju artikulisali i organizovano pokušali riješiti, što ću pokušati dakle i da... Pokažem. Dakle, zadatak istoristke materialistkinje jeste da pokuša da konstruktivno reartikuliše istoriografsku formu bez da se nostalgično, bilo je puno priče o nostalgiji i mislim da je ovdje zanimljivo da raščanim kako sam ja tome prilazila, znači bez da se nostalgično vrati priče iz prošlosti, već da je prepozna kao biljeg i trag. Dakle, govorili smo o svetlani bojim u petak, o restorativnoj, odnosno refleksivnoj nostalgiji, znači restorativna nostalgija je nešto što ono značuje kao loše, a ta refleksivna je ta koja nam u stvari omogućuje prepoznavanje ovog biljega i traga. Jer sam u rupturi gdje se mišljenje u konstelaciji zasićenoj napetostima iznenada zaustavlja i zadaje šok, leži revolucionarna šansa u borbi za podjarmljenu prošlost. Pored toga, baviti se arhivom u smislu ovog odnosa svjedočanstva, testamenta i testimoni svjedočanstva i zavještanja nije samo pitanje prošlosti. To nije pitanje koncepta koji ima veze sa suočavanjem s prošlošću, koji nam je već na raspolaganju ili nam nije na raspolaganju, nekim konceptom arhiva koji je moguće arhivirati. To je prvenstveno pitanje budućnosti, pitanje, ovo je Derida, same budućnosti, pitanje odgovora, obećanja i odgovornosti za sutrašnicu, jer meta, arhiv i original postoje samo u budućnosti. Ako želimo da znamo što arhiv znači, kaže Derida, to ćemo samo saznati u vremenima koja dolaze, možda, ne sutra, već u vremenima koja dolaze kasnije ili nikada. Prvi korak je svakako interpretacija arhivske građe koja rasvjetljava, čita i tumači svoj objekat, upisujući se u njega, otvarajući ga i obogačujući ga dovoljno s pravom ima svoje mjesto u njemu. Ne znam kako stojimo s vremenom jer bi sad pročitala neke čisto vinjetice, malo evo kad govorimo o OFŽ-u u međunarodnom kontekstu, znači ima situacija kad u Sarajevo sleće Jevgenija Žiguljenko, ženja, heroj Sovjetskog saveza i pilotkinja koja je sama dovezla delegaciju i sad priča se kako u Sarajevu duševljenje dostiže vrhu u nas, znači žene su se skupile da vide tu pilotkinju. I kaže, to je pristupačna i bliska žena koju već odavno poznajemo preko Poline Osipenko, Valentine Grizodubove i drugih hrabri pilotkinja o kojima smo čitale i divile im se još onda kada su se osposoljavale za velika dijela koje su stvarili u Narodno slobodlačkom ratu. Još jedan zadimljiv trenutak jeste kada pronalazim ime Evženiko Ton i pitam se koja je Evženiko Ton, dakle prvi put se susrećem s tim imenom, upravo u časopisu Naša žena i onda dođem do informacije da će Francesca de Haan treba sa CEU-a da objavi knjigu o Women's International Democratic Federation, dakle kao jedno od najbesovnijih ženskih organizacija koja je prvo bila zabranjena u Americi uslijed tokom Ekartijevske ere, ali koja je zaista jedna velika, velika ženska organizacija koja je i da kažem, okupila žene iz različitih konteksta, gdje zapravo, dakle, i tu međunarodnu žensku frontu su, dakle, i Jugoslovenke, jel, bile su osnivačice u toj priči, to je nešto što vam je, recimo, potpuno odsutno iz zapadne feminističke istoriografije. Dakle, i čitav taj odnos šta se dešavalo sa istočno-evropskim, sa jugoslovenskim socijalistkinjama, partizankama, da li su one bile feministkinje ili nisu, to je sad tema za jednu drugu raspravu. Evo, to je meni bilo zanimljivo. Dakle, u inicijativnom odboru tog kongresa bile su žene iz Bugarske, Brazila, Portugala, Katalonije i koje čega. Zatim, pod broj dva, to su, dakle, ciljevi tog Pariškog svjetskog kongresa žena bile su usmjereni na saradnju žena cijelog svijeta na jednom prilično progresivnom programu koji je, dakle, imao za cilj uništiti fašizam, pripremiti srećnu budućnost novim pokoljenjima i dati ženi prava izraženim u internacionalnoj povelji žena, kao majci, radnici, građanki i tako dalje, i kao rezultat toga imamo taj čuveni ustav iz 1946. u kojem se sve to navodi. E sad, beneficije tog ustava su Jugoslovenke u nekoj većoj mjeri počeli uživati tek 60. godina. On je postao tu deklarativno, međutim, generacije moje bake, rođene 28. krajem 20. godina, nisu, dakle, uživale u tim prednostima. Dakle, to je zanimljivo. Ova priča oko zaposlenosti, da se, da taj 51. broj žena radnica skače za 90% i da je najdramatičniji poraz zabilježen upravo u Bosni i Hercegovini. 
E sad, onaj moment tog zajedničkog sestrinstva i jedinstva, kako sam ga nazvala, to je jedno simultano interpeliranje, zazivanje, vi imate u našoj ženi, u glasu, oj, malte ne ono, oj, vi srpkinje, hrvatice i muslimanke, sjetite se kako je bilo prije, danas je to drugo, recimo Dušanka Kovačević kaže, za živote naše djece. Ja sad razmišljam da bi to zaista u ovom post-dejtonskom kontekstu, evo, Đurđa je juče pitala zašto nikad nije bila feministička partija, da bi tu se mogli naći elementi za neko novo organizovanje. Evo, Dušanka Kovačević će reći 45. za živote naše djece, za mir naših domova, da nikada više ne bude klanja i ubijanja, mi smo se ujedinile. Jedinstvo Srpkinja, muslimanki i hrvatica objasniće čitavom svijetu otkud nam snaga za borbu, otkud nam vjera u pobjedu. Srpkinje, muslimanke i hrvatice pričat će na kongresu o svojoj djeci koje zajednički oslobađaju zemlju, o zajedničkim poslovima koje obavljaju. Tu se naravno puno spominje i porodica Maglajlić iz Banja Luke, pa imate taj zanimljiv moment gdje je Vahida Maglajlić i Rada Vranješević pod zarovima distribujuću poštu, ilegalnu poštu i tako te nekakve snažne, snažne trope. Ali evo i pročitat ću, isto pošto je zgodno ovdje, pjesma Razije Hanđić koja govori o starim i novim muslimankama. I ona kaže, opisujući njihovo kretanje, Razija kaže sljedeće, u prvoj pjesmi ona kaže sljedeće, U dugom sablasnom ruhu promiču gluho kao kroz san, ko uklete duvne, ko slijepe ptice sa crnim velom kroz sunčan dan. A u drugoj, kako se kreće, je li ta nova muslimanka Jugoslovenka, Ka moru žena talasalo što se na svoj kongres prvi jedna u zaru sa transparentom ko da bi prešla i preko krvi. Imamo potpuno različite dvije, ne samo pjesničke slike, već i reprezentacije i sl. Evo, nešto ću kratko reći, dakle, o masovnom opismenjavanju. Treba da opavimo pohod protiv nepismenosti, rekla je drugarica Olga Kovačić. Nijedno dijete u našim gradovima i selima, nijedna žena ne smije ostati nepismena. Znači, tu je, za tečaj se prijavljuju 60-godišnjakinje, znači imamo jedan masovni pohod protiv nepismenosti. E sad bi još samo rekla nekoliko stvari, a koliko mi ostaje? Pet minuta? Da. O tom značaju AFŽ u kontekstu današnjice gdje fokus bacam dakle na one stvari koji meni smetaju, znači koje vidim kao problematične, a to su isto tako etnokapitalizam, repatriarchalizacija, nacionalizam i nepismenost. Znači samo isto mala digresija kad pričam o repatriarchalizaciji, postoje feministkinje koja je ta teza o repatriarchalizaciji problematična, jer podrazumijeva depatriarchalizaciju socijalizmu. To je taj kompleksni odnos između šta je ženama donijeli Jugoslavi više emancipacije, da li socijalizam ili feminizam, naročito poslije 78. E, ja tu sad onako pokušavam malo igrati na sigurno i uvodim pojem depatriarchalizacijskog potencijala. I mislim da je to zgodno, pošto ćemo se puno sukobljavati oko ovih brojki, šta je urađeno i da li je revolucija zaustavljena. Vjerovatno jeste, žene jesu postale wage earners, nadničarke. Od te jednakosti u četi gdje se zajednički i urišana neprijatelja, vrlo brzo će se ženu staviti u njeno prirodno okruženje, domačičko i sl. I bilo je tu borbine, mogu da kažem da je ta istorija glatko tekla, ali ja mislim da možemo danas govoriti o tom depatriarchalizacijskom potencijalu, dakle u Jugoslavi, iako naravno da nije ista Jugoslavija bila 50. i 60. i 70. i 80. Dakle, ono što vidim kao problem jeste da uprkos proliferacije identitarne politike 20 godina tog rodnog mainstreaminga, koji prvenstveno vidim, postoji knjiga Innocence and Victimhood, Elise Helms, koja govori o tome da se poslije ratova 90. u Bosnu i Hercegovinu slilo dosta novca i pokušalo formirati ženskih organizacija koje nisu nužno bile feminističke, dakle, koje su igrali na tu viktimološku kartu, znači, bilo je puno te priče o žrtvama, da bi smo vidjeli žene koje su bile vlasnice, direktorice tih organizacija kako se zapravo samo bogate. Znači, to je ta kritika čitava NGO-izacije i te scene. To isto vrijedi i za gender project driven feminism, ili kako god. Mi danas imamo zaista malo osnova za kolektivnu mobilizaciju. Kako danas možemo uopšte organizovati bilo koga? Evo, mi imamo tu iskustvo rada u socijalnom centru koje je, mislim, manje ili više uspješno, ali zaista uvijek se suočamo s tim kako mobilizirati, kako organizovati bilo kakav otpor. 
I u prkos, dakle, ograničenjima i fazama jugoslovenskog modernitete, mora se reći i to da je patrijarhat i u SFR je opstao, znači u privatnoj sferi i to znamo po tome što je nasilje u porodici bilo tabu. Znači, nasilje u porodici dolazi u vidokrug tek, ne znam, 90-ih ili 2000-ih. Dakle, to pitanje nije bilo do kraja rješeno uprko svojim ministričkim nastojanjima iz 70-ih, a recimo imamo zanimljiv primjer, o tome govori Nebojša Jovanović, kako se reprezentacije već jugoslovenskih žena sa kraja 80-ih, on navodi tu primjer filma Kuduz, da su zanimljive jer je zapravo Badema, to mi piše i Bogdan Tirnanić i mnogi drugi, da je Bademu kao lošu majku trebalo ubiti, da je on zapravo ubija. Tako da, evo, ja bih da, mislim, da zaključim, pošto puno već pričam, kako bilježiti ugljenom da bi se oživjela žar, da se vratimo na studena s početka teksta, da bismo pamtili ove borbe ne kao slike na zidu obešene, u kojima se ostaje za vek na vek, već kao aktivno mobilizacijsko gorivo za današnje žene, kad su borkinje i jafe želke uglavnom pokojne, a znanja, o njima slabo prisutno u javnoj sferi. Dakle, šta, kako zapravo uopšte pristupati tom problemu za to neko buduće vrijeme, kada, dakle, taj arhiv, evo i ovo što smo vidjeli, jeli, on pršti od tih emancipacijskih mogućnosti za žene, bez obzira na klasu, dob ili etički predznak, posebno kad je riječ o jednoj velikoj većini koja je tad bila moguća, znači mobilizirano je preko dva miliona žena, pisati onom što se ne može suzbiti. Šta je ono znanje što se ne može suzbiti? Jer ja ga osjećam, dakle, i pokušavam ga, da kažem, opisati, predstaviti, ali i živjeti kao aktivistkinja, pristati onome što se ne može suzbiti u afeželskom iskustvu. Znači, ponovno ih prisvojiti kroz današnje socijalističko-feminističke političke prakse, kao blohovski princip nade u kojoj društvena utopija osvještava i dokida ljudsku i žensku bjedu. Ono znači i ne pristati na i odupirati se statusu quo u kojem navodni nacionalizam protkan patriarhatom već dvije decenije maskira masovnu eksploataciju etnokapitalista proizvodeći djecu za rat i neplaćeni rad. Stopiti horizonte sa istorijske distance, znači repolitizirati taj status quo, omogućivši mjesto susreta za neko buduće veliko vrijeme gdje ćemo se kada se sretnemo moći organizovati za borbu. Znanja o njima predstavljaju alternativnu istoriju, ključnu za razumijevanje budućih društvenih borbi, za gerlitarnije društvo, ne samo kad je u pitanju otpor kapitalističkoj proizvodnji, već i proizvodnje nove djece za rat, što bolno djekuje u kriku savremene sarajevske pjesnikinje Dijale Hasanbegović. Ne dam djecu za rat, govorim vam dlanova okrenutih prema gore, dlanova ljepljivih od kiselih žutih vrpci koje krvnici nikada neće prerezati. Hvala. time when we switch to English and we're going to have uh, Cornelia Grabner through Skype. Great. So while, yeah, while we are sorting out the technical stuff, I just want to check that did we distribute the Cornelia song? So while Alex and Mark are distributing Cornelia's material uh, and we are sorting out Skype here, I'm just going to shortly introduce Cornelia comes from Lancaster University. Yesterday we had the opportunity to hear a bit more general introduction from her and today we're going to listen about global resonances and movements for peace and justice and dignity in Mexico. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hi, Noah. Oh, yes, I can't see. Yes, hang on a second. I'll switch the camera on. Okay. Um. There you go. Yes? Can you see me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so, um, have you started the panel? Yes, yes, yes we already yes, had one lecture. Okay. Uh, and uh, Mishko already presented you, so you can start uh, the lecture. Okay. 
cool. Let me just get some water. Okay, so um, in today's presentation, I re revisit some work that I did in 2013 and 2014 on poetry recited during the movement for peace with justice and dignity in Mexico in 2011 and 2012. I want to revisit this work, which was published in a special issue edited by the project Poetry in Public Spaces for the journal Liminalities, from the perspective of one of the questions that I raised in yesterday's talk. How can listeners hear out and respond to poetic testimonies of 21st century violence? Crucial to this work was the attempt to conceptualize listening spaces to show the ways in which listening and resonance are as important to poetry as speech. Is that, is that an okay speed? Yes, yes. Yeah? yeah. Can be a oh. little slower. A little slower? Okay. Yeah. So, the movement for peace with justice and dignity emerged in April 2011 during a particularly spectacular escalation of generalized and gruesome violence in Mexico, which occurred during the presidency of Felipe Calderón from 2006 to 2012. Calderón took office in December 2006 after a highly controversial election. <clears throat> the official result of that election gave tight victory to Calderón and his National Action Party. However, there were multiple allegations of election fraud and people demanded a recount of votes, which was denied them. The slim majority and the accusations of fraud meant that Calderón had very little democratic legitimacy as president. At the same time, state violence against social movement and dissident communities escalated on either side of the election. Most well known were um, what happened in San Salvador at Tenco and in Oaxaca. You can ask me about that later if you like. At the same time, la large scale direct and indirect violence occurred throughout the country. Sometimes it was gendered violence, as in the case of the femicide, most notoriously in the north of the country. Other vulnerable populations included migrants from Mexico and from Central America who were crossing Mexico. Organized crime perpetrated violence in an increasingly chaotic and sanguinary way, war over dominance among the different gangs or cartels and over their territories. And notoriously, organized crime often worked together with agents of the state. Direct violence was also perpetrated by paramilitary groups against the Anonymous Zapatista communities in the south of the country and against other indigenous populations, often in the context of their resistance to natural resource extraction on their land. Shortly after taking office, Calderon declared a war on drug cartels and drugs, a war that was heavily aided by the US. The warlike rhetoric and the constant evocation of a dispersed enemy within seemed to aim at establishing an authoritarian and militarized authority for the government and the president. And one of the things that happened, one of the consequences of that war on drugs, was that it created conditions for intense repression of deviant and dissident populations. It compounded a long history of structural and physical violence and added forms of state repression that were innovated in quotation marks is a characteristically neoliberal lack of accountability. And it created an opportunity, firstly, to not look at the different sources of violence. So for example, um, the violence that occurred during around the implementation of ex extractivist projects, sexualized and gendered violence, violence related to the drug trade. So um, the general information meant that people weren't looking anymore at what exactly happens in those instances. It was just a generalization of violence as such. And secondly, it meant um, it made it possible to target all sorts of people and then hold those people themselves responsible for their own assassination. Victims of violence were stigmatized and assumptions were made about them being engaged in deviant and of no activities, with the added assumption that with its functional judiciary, such activities constituted at the very least an excuse for killing those people. The victims of this violence were thus no longer considered victims and communities, family and friends found themselves in a situation of grieving for lives that were rendered ungrievable by what threatened to become a hegemonic discourse. Moreover, the spectacular ways in which the cells um, or the bodies were put on show 
um, turn the bodies into messages. So you had at the time, for example, the narco videos where um, where the gangs would, uh, where people would fill basically the, the torture and the killing of, um, of others and would then upload that on YouTube. Um, or you had the display of bodies, which you know, became very notorious across the world, like with, or just of heads cut off, um, which were then put on display in public places, bodies that were wrapped in um, in sheets with messages written on them, and then um, hung off bridges. And, um, and that is actually, John Gibler explicates this in his book, To Die and Get Dispatches from and he actually phrased it very well, so I quote it. I quote, a death with no name, a death that extinguishes who you were along with who you are, a death that holds you before the world as a testament only to death itself. All that is left is your body destroyed in a vacant lot, hanging from a highway overpass or locked into the trunk of a car. Your name is severed, cut off, or discarded. The only history that remains attached to your body instead of your particular death. Bullet holes, burns, slashes, contusions, limbs removed. The executioners of this killing ground destroy each person twice. First, they obliterate your world. If you're lucky, they do so with a spray of bullets. But then, once you are gone, they will turn your body from that of a person into that of a message. You will lose your name. You will lose your past, the record of your loves and fears, triumphs and failures, and all the small things in between. Those who look upon you will see only this. End of quote. Such, such messages, and even the chief fact that the body can be objectified with a message, horrify those who look upon the dead and trans, transfix them to the paralysis described by Adriana Cabarero in Horrorism. And I quote, in contrast to what occurs with terror, in horror there is no instinctive movement of flight in order to survive, much less contagious turmoil or panic. Rather, movement is blocked in total paralysis, and each victim is affected on its own. Gripped by, by revulsion in the face of a form of violence that seems more inadmissible than death, the body reacts as if near to the spot, hair standing on end. End of quote. The movement for peace with justice and dignity tried to resist and reverse that course, and they were, at least in part, to a point successful. The movement emerged Javier Sicilia refused to accept the initial blame laid on his son Francisco Javier, who was killed aged 24 together with six of his friends. Initially, the authorities tried to suggest that he had been involved in activities related to organized crime. His family refused to accept that. Instead, Cecilia wrote a public letter to Mexico's politicians and criminals, and then marched in protest from Cuernavaca to Mexico City. That march attracted many other people who had also lost loved ones and many more who no longer wanted to be innocent and impotent bystanders to the escalation of violence that swept their country. It ended in a large concentration of people on the central square of Mexico City and it became the first of many. All the marches or caravanas started off with poetry reading and then people who were affected by the violence shared their stories while those present listened in an intense and resident way. It was through this listening that a consensus was to grieve people together, communally, and as victims of brutality and violence, so not as people who were in some way to be held responsible. And um, I now want to um, look at a poetry recital that took place during that very first meeting in the central square of Mexico City. It's by the poet Maria Rivera of um, Los Muertos Dead. Um, I know that I promised two poems, but I'm afraid um, that providing sufficient context is impossible to fit them both into 20 minutes. But much of what I would have said is in my article, Pub Public Spaces and Global Listening Spaces. It's available free online, and so you can read it there. And there are also some other poems. Um, so I now would like you to listen to Maria Rivera. Um, the recording does not have English subtitles. Um, but um, I think you have a printout of the of the English text, don't you? Um, so I don't know if you could try. Um, a lot of it is actually in the in the way in which she reads it. Um, so even if you try to follow the the words on the page, try to also be receptive to to her body language. 
as she does the recital. Yeah, so um, can we can we have a, the recital? Yes, but if Buenas tardes. Yo voy a leer un poema que se llama El Capulín. Se llama Rey. Allá vienen los descabezados, los mancos, los descuartizados, a las que les partieron el coxis, a los que les aplastaron la cabeza los pequeñitos llorando entre paredes oscuras de minerales y arena. Allá vienen los que duermen en edificios de tumbas clandestinas. Vienen con los ojos vendados, atadas las manos, acuchillados, quemados, baleados entre las sienes. Allí vienen los que se perdieron por Tamaulipas, cuñados, vecinos, yernos, vecinos, la mujer que violaron entre todos antes de matarla, el hombre que intentó evitarlo y recibió un balazo, la que también violaron, escapó y lo contó, viene caminando por Broadway, se consuela con el llanto de las ambulancias, las puertas de los hospitales, la luz brillando en el agua del Hudson. Allá vienen los muertos que salieron de Usuluatán, de la paz, de la unión, de, li de la libertad, de Sonsonete, de San Salvador, de San Juan Mistepec, de Cuscatlán, del progreso, del guante, llorando, a los que madres soñaron muertos, a los que despidieron en una fiesta con karaoke y los encontraron baleados en Tecate. Allí viene al que obligaron a cavar la fosa para su hermano, al que asesinaron luego de cobrar cuatro mil dólares los que estuvieron secuestrados con una mujer que violaron frente a su hijo de ocho años tres veces. ¿De dónde vienen? ¿De qué gangrena? ¡Oh, linfa! Los sanguinarios, los desalmados, los carniceros, los cruentos asesinos. Allí vienen los muertos, tan solitos, tan mudos, tan nuestros, engarzados bajo el cielo enorme de la náhuac. Caminan, se arrastran, con su cuenco de horror entre las manos, su espeluznante ternura. Se llaman los muertos que encontraron en una fosa en Tasco, los muertos que encontraron en parajes alejados de Chihuahua, los muertos que encontraron esparcidos en parcelas de cultivo, los muertos que encontraron tirados en la marquesa, los muertos que encontraron colgando de los puentes, los muertos que encontraron sin cabeza en terrenos ejidales, los muertos que encontraron a la orilla de la carretera, los muertos que encontraron en coches abandonados, los muertos que encontraron en San Fernando, los sin número que destazaron y aún no encuentran, las piernas, los brazos, las cabezas, los fémures de muertos disueltos en tambo, se llaman restos, cadáveres, oxisos, se llaman los muertos a los que madres no se cansan de esperar, los muertos a los que hijos no se cansan de esperar, los muertos que esposas no se cansan de esperar, imaginan entre subways y gringos. Se llaman chambrita tejida en el cajón del alma, camisetita de tres veces, la foto de la sonrisa chimuela. Se llaman mamita, papito, se llaman pataditas en el vientre y el primer llanto. Se llaman cuatro hijos, Petronia dos, Zacarías tres, Saba cinco, Glenda seis y una viuda muchacha que se, se enamoró cuando estudiaba la primaria. Se llaman ganas de bailar en las fiestas. Se llaman rubor de mejillas encendidas y manos sudorosas. Se llaman muchachos, se llaman ganas de construir una casa echar tabique, darle de comer a mis hijos. Se llaman dos dólares por limpiar frijoles, casas, haciendas, oficinas, llantos de niños en pisos de tierra, la luz volando sobre los pájaros, el vuelo de las palomas en la iglesia. Se llaman besos a la orilla del río, se llaman Helder 17, Daniel 22, Filmar 24, Ismael 15, José 16. Jacinta 21, Inés 
28, Francisco, 53, entre matorrales, amordazados, en jardines de ranchos de seguridad, maniatados, desvaneciéndose en parajes olvidados, desintegrándose muda, calladamente. Se llaman secretos de sicarios, secretos de masacres, secretos de policías. Se llaman llanto, se llaman neblina, se llaman cuerpo, se llaman piel, se llaman tibieza, se llaman beso, se llaman abrazo, se llaman risa, se llaman personas, se llaman súplicas, se llamaban yo, se llamaban tú, se llamaban nosotros, se llaman vergüenza, se llaman llanto. Allá van María, Juana, Petra, Carolina, 13, 18, 25, 16, los pechos mordidos, las manos atadas, calcinados sus cuerpos, sus huesos pulidos por la arena del desierto, se llaman las muertas que nadie sabe, nadie vio que mataran. Se llaman las mujeres que salen de noche solas a los bares. Se llaman mujeres que trabajan, salen de sus casas en la madrugada. Se llaman hermanas, hijas, madres, tías, desaparecidas, violadas, calcinadas, aventadas. Se llaman carne, se llaman carne. Allá, sin flores, sin altares, sin losas. Sin edad, sin deudos, sin nombre, sin llanto, duermen en su cementerio. Se llama Temisco, se llama Santana, se llama Mazatepec, se llama Juárez, se llama Puente de Ixtla, se llama Tlaltizapán, se llama Samalayuca, se llama El Capulín, se llama Reynosa, se llama Nuelo Laredo, se llama Guadalupe. Se llama Lomas de Poleo, se llama México. Muchas gracias. Okay. Yeah, it's finished. Thank you. So, um, the way in which the Movement for Peace with Justice and Dignity set up these meetings. Um, What was important was not only what was said, but also how people listened. And you can tell that by the by the large numbers of people who came and who actually um, practiced a kind of resonance, of resonant listening, that meant sharing that campaign and acknowledging that all those dead are ours. Yeah. Um, and I should maybe add that around that time, Conservative estimates said that about 38,000 people had been killed and about 5,000 had become victims of disappearance. And um, the other thing that I should maybe also add, because I don't know if I will get a chance to say that later, but sometimes um, people tend to say that it is a Mexican problem, that uh, Mexico has some sort of inherent density for violence, and I would absolutely refute that. It's absolutely not the case. Um, anything related to organized crime nowadays is a global issue, which has also to do with money laundering um, with, and with um, decay of democratic structures and so on. So, you know, no, there, it's, not, it's not a Mexican problem. It's just that Mexico was, was the country always this exploded. And, um, One of the things that Maria Rivera does in the poem is that she looks at that, she looks at what has become 21st century image of hell um, without rejecting it and by having the internal strength of resonating with the image of hell. Image of hell is a term that I borrowed from Hannah Arendt, who used it as a critical concept with reference to testimonial doctor documentary and analytical work on the Holocaust. Um, and she um, said that in the review of two books, um, she said that actually um, the verbally conveyed analysis of the writers failed, and I quote, to understand or make clear the nature of the facts confronting them. Um, and The facts are with respect to 
um, one of those books that six million human beings were dragged to their deaths through the method of what Arendt called accumulated terror, calculated neglect, deprivation and shame, outright starvation combined with forced labor, and then the death factories where, she says, they all died together, like things that had neither body nor soul, nor even a physiognomy upon which death stamped its seal. The nature of these facts is what Arendt calls this monstrous equality without fraternity or humanity, in which we see as no mirror the image of hell. And what Arendt describes here is that horror that transfixes people when they are confronted with modes of killing, which perhaps create types of death killer subjectivities that exceed the language we have for our either. Um, and so part of what movement for justice with peace with, for, for peace with justice and dignity tried to was to get through that moment, to be able to look at the image of Pierre, take it in um, without without standing transfixed, transfixed in horror. What um, what Rivera then does in the poem is that first of all um, she launches herself into it without any detail into introduction. Um, and at first, especially during the sections of the poem in which she compels her listeners to look at that image of hell in that parade, which is reminiscent of a dance macabre. She stands still, but as the poem progresses through three sections, structured around showing, naming, and locating, her voice and her body progressively, progressively give themselves to motion. So what she does first is that she shows us that parade of dead bodies um, the individuals who were killed are distinguishable only by the modes of killing, because the ways in which they were killed left them to paraphrase Arendt without a physiognomy upon which death could stamp its seal. They are beheaded, handless, dismembered, they are women whose coccyx were smashed, and whose heads were crushed, children who pry between dark walls of minerals and sand. But if the physiognomy cannot reveal, reveal to us the true nature of the facts, then we need to look for something else. For example, the circumstances of the kids. And that's what she then does. So here comes the one who was forced to grave for his brother, the one they murdered after collecting $4,000, those who were kidnapped with the woman they raped in front of her eight-year-old eight son three times. Rivera places care and compassion in her look upon the dead and expresses verbally a sparse, a conscientious occupation of their relationships and attachments of the actions that may have informed the last moments of their lives, of the betrayed hopes of survival, of what was done to them and to those who were to watch. In contrast, the perpetrators of the scenario are placed outside the fair comprehension in a question that resonates with Arendt's statement, beyond the capacities of human comprehension is the deformed wickedness of those who established such equality in death. So Rivera then asks, where do they come from? From which gangrene or limbs? The bloodthirsty, the soulless, the butchers, the murderers. So she, Rivera's question replaces the first part of our sentence. So she has to ask a question because that kind of understanding cannot come from the care, compassion that define her look upon others. The distancing expressed in Rivera's question starkly contrasts with the search for closeness at the beginning of the next. They, they, there they come, the dead, so long, so, so lonely, so silent, so hours, where she connects the living with the dead through an understanding based on care and, at the same time, expresses the terrible impotence of le leaving them so, so lonely, so silent, even when they are so out. The section, sec second section of the poem is structured around the gesture of naming, which restores to the dead not their name, first and last names, but to paraphrase Gibbler, their, first, their personal names, their past, the record of their loves and fears, triumphs and failures, and all the small things in between. So they are called tiny sweater woven in a drawer of the soul, tiny t-shirt for a three month old, photograph of a toothless smile. They're called mamita, papi. They're called tiny kicks in the womb and the first cry. 
They're called four children, Petonia, those two, Zacharias, three, and Sarah's five, Glenda says, and a widow girl who fell in love in elementary school. They're called wanting to dance at parties. They're called reddening of flushed cheeks and sweaty palms. They're called boys. They're called wanting to build a house, to lay brick, bricks, to give my children something to eat. They're called $2 for cleaning beans, houses, and siendas offices. They're called cries of children on dirt floors, light flying over birds, flight of doves in the church. They're called kisses at the edge of the river. They're called 17, Daniel 22, Filmar 24. Ismael, 15, Agustin, 20, Jose, 16, Jacinta, 21, Ines, 28, Francisco, 53, and that's the, the end of the quote. So what she does um, is that she maintains a balance between intimate detail, what could have been publicly known, so that she doesn't invade their privacy, and at the same time, she doesn't depersonalize them. So even though the executioners may have destroyed the physiognomy upon which death could stamp its seal, the dead are now not like things that had neither body nor soul. And in the last section of the poem, Ribera, whose body and voice are now completely given to movement, takes her listeners to those graveyards without mourners, where the dead are kept in a monstrous equality without fraternity or humanity. There, with no flowers, with no gravestones, with no age, with no name, with no tears, they sleep in their cemetery. She then lists some of the cities and regions of, of that cemetery, ending on it, the cemetery is called Mexico. So um, what, she, uh, what she does there is that she um, basically provides a space for, for all the people who are listening to that, to that recital of the poem to make them ours, to become the mourners on that cemetery and to actually mourn, um, to mourn those dead, those dead have been, who had been stigmatized, who had been rejected, who had been with those who the hegemonic discourse had tried to place on the outside. Um, and that was something that the movement for peace and justice for, with justice and dignity did throughout um, their activity, which probably ran about um, a year, which also took them to the United States. And actually, if you wanted to, um, most of the videos on them are subtitled in English and they are available on the internet. So what you can see when you watch those um, is that that resonance, um, which, as Kate Lacey says, is type of listening, um, which is not only about the politics of voice, but um, where the response to what is said doesn't have to be immediate and doesn't have to be in kind. So speech doesn't have to be answered with speech. Speech can be responded to by that resonance. And establishing that as a way of dealing with such a generalized, um, terrible grief um, was a communal effort, really, by very many people, um, which it, <clears throat> which is something that really does even still come across in those in those videos. If you actually go to my, my article, that has all the links in it so that you can just watch it. So I just like to end sort of um, on the remark of really that was an example of people not buckling down, um, not deferring to the horror that they were living, but actually getting together on a large scale, mobilizing their capacity to organize, um, to well, to, res to respond to one of our contemporary images of hell and experiences of hell um, without rejection, um, without trivialization, and by actually sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so, Nina, I will, we, we have another lecture now, and I will uh, call you again when we have the discussion like in uh, in half an hour, something like that. Very good. Thank you, Cornelia, and thank you, Noah. And now we're going to have the last presentation by Robert van Halberg. Robert is a professor of literature at Claremont McKenna uh, College in California, United States. He's also a member of the US Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among many books, Robert, the, I would just take one title which resonated with me, that's the book Literary Powers from the 2008 where 
Robert argues about the limits and authority of poetry in different contexts regarding time and space. Uh, something that also I think came out as argument yesterday with uh, Kant and Hegel and their influence on the right-wing politics. Today Robert is going to tell us about testimony and U.S. poetry. So thank you very much. I want to start by thanking Noah uh, for the invitation to come. I've enjoyed the collaboration with all of you and with the others who have spoken uh, in the last few days. And uh, I've, I've benefited from it. And I'm thinking about things a little differently now. So thank you. Um, I uh, wrote a, a paper about, I thought I'd talk about two poems. Uh, and they're on the handout, one by John Milton, 17th century, a 1655 poem, uh, and then contrast that with uh, a more recent poem, 1967 poem by the poet Anthony Hecht. Uh, and I did that, and, uh, and it's too long. So <laughs> I'm just going to talk about one poem, okay? Uh, and that's the Anthony Hecht poem. So I'll say some things in general about testimony and poetry, and then I'll read the poem. Um, and then I'll go back to talking about it. So poems, uh, like testimony, are meant to be memorable and authoritative. Power makes things happen, but authority makes them right. One gives testimony of an atrocity, a crime, or just a regrettable act, suffered or observed. To those who at their own hazard step forward to testify about the misdeeds of the powerful, one is right to be grateful. And yet Americans who remember the 1950s, or if not the 1950s, maybe the 1962 film, The Manchurian Candidate, John Frankenheimer film, they may can, they may think some about the prob problematics of testimony. In a courtroom, testimony entails the obligation to tell the truth. One must identify oneself and be subject to prosecution if one bears false witness against another. Moreover, one cannot report what one has heard from others who have not accepted the responsibility of testifying in court, hearsay. A witness who uh, a, a witness is also subject to cross-examination by the accused or by an attorney representing the accused. These unattractive constraints are necessary because zeal leads even well-meaning people to say things that are not entirely true. One reasonably wants denunciation to be neither easy nor advantageous. Heightened surveillance an inevitable consequence of denunciations is undesirable to many Americans. It should not be controversial to receive testimony skeptically, uh, but right now in the States it certainly is. In no court do poems count as testimony. Poets are notorious for misrepresentation. But some great poems imitate testimony because many poets are ready witnesses of their moment. Most great poems are exploratory. They seek meaning as they go. We've been talking about Ceylon. This is certainly the case with Ceylon. Testimony, however, solicits belief in what has already transpired and is being related, not analyzed or conjectured. When paradox and contradiction arise in testimony, they cause trouble. The voice of a denouncer bears a flaw insofar as no adult is innocent. We know that. Denunciation rests on a notion that even though genuine innocence is not to be had, one can be sufficiently righteous to denounce another. The one thing that, that can bring a denouncer down is hypocrisy. Of whatever one is guilty, it should not be that which one denounces in another. 
This is rarely an issue for poets because they commonly denounce people in another line of work. Except in cases like that of Ezra Pound, who in the poem Hugh Selwyn Moberly denounces statesmen for misrepresentation. For poets as well often misrepresent, as Plato argued, and Pound was held accountable for his misrepresentations. He did 12 and a half years uh, in incarceration. One gives testimony against correctable or distinctive misdeeds. There's no point in denouncing the paradoxes of human nature. And now I'll, I'll read the Anthony Heck poem. And maybe at some point in life, you'll want to look at the John Milton poem yourself. I'll say a word or two about the John Milton poem, but, but not much. Anthony Hecht, Behold the Lilies of the Field. And now, an attempt. Don't tense yourself. Take it easy. Look at the flowers there in the glass bowl. Yes, they're lovely and fresh. I remember giving my mother flowers once, rather like those. Are they narcissus or jonquils? And I hoped she would show some pleasure in them, but got that mechanical, enthusiastic show she used on the telephone once in praising some friend for thoughtfulness or good taste or whatever it was. And when she hung up, turned to us all and said, God, what a bore she is. I think she was trying to show us how honest she was, at least with us. But the effect was just the opposite. And now I don't think she knows what honesty is. Your mother's a whore, someone said. Not meaning she slept around, though perhaps this was part of it, but meaning she had lost all sense of honor. And I think this is true. But that's not what I wanted to say. What was it I wanted to say? When he said that about mother, I had to laugh. I really did. It was so amazingly true. Where was I? Lie back, relax. Oh yes, I remember now what it was. It was what I saw them do to the emperor. They captured him, you know, eagles and all. They stripped him and made an iron collar for his neck. And they made a cage out of our captured spears and they put him inside, naked and collared and exposed to the view of the whole enemy camp. And I was tied to a post and made to watch when he was taken out and flogged by one of their generals and then forced to offer his ripped back as a mounting block for the barbarian king to get on his horse. And one time to get down on all fours to be the royal throne when the king received our ambassadors to discuss the question of ransom. Of course, he didn't want ransom. And I was tied to a post and made to watch. That's enough for now. Lie back. Try to relax. No, that's not all. They kept it up for two months. We were taken to their outmost provinces. It was always the same and we were made to watch, the others and I. How he stood it, I don't know. And then suddenly, there were no more floggings or humiliations. The king's personal doctor saw to his back. He was given decent clothing, and the collar was taken off. And they treated us all with a special courtesy. By the time we reached their capital city, his back was completely healed. They had taken the cage apart, but of course they didn't give us back our spears. Then later that month, it was a warm afternoon in May, the rest of us were marched out to the central square. The crowds were there already, and the posts were set up to which we were tied in the old watching positions. And he was brought out in the old way and stripped and then tied flat on a big rectangular table so that only his head could move. Then the king made a short speech to the crowds, to which they responded with gasps of wild excitement, and which was then translated for the rest of us. It was the sentence. He was to be flayed alive. 
as slowly as possible to drag out the pain. And we were made to watch. The king's personal doctor, the one who attended his back, came forward with a tray of surgical knives. They began at the feet. And we were not allowed to close our eyes or to look away. When they were done, hours later, the skin was turned over to one of their saddle makers to be tanned and stuffed and sewn. And for what? a hideous life-sized doll filled out with straw in the skin of the Roman Emperor Valerian. With blanks of mother of pearl under the eyelids and painted shells that had been prepared beforehand for the fingernails and toenails, roughly cross-stitched on the inseam of the legs and up the back to the center of the head, swung in the wind on a rope from the palace flagpole and young girls were brought there by their mothers to be told about the male anatomy. His death had taken hours. They were very patient, and with him passed away the honor of Rome. In the end, I was ransomed. Mother paid for me. You must rest now. You must. Lean back. Look at the flowers. Yes, I am looking. I wish I could be like them. The opening line of uh, Anthony Heck's poem, 1967 poem, I think I mentioned, sounds like something an announcer might say, as if introducing a display and now an attempt. The voice in italics is that of an analyst. The word attempt indicates that the narrative voice wants to speak of something repressed, apparently an experience of interrog interrogation, as I'll as I'll indicate. But the term, too, has a suggestion of performance that's odd in addressing an analyst who is about to hear from the deep. Then come two stories, the second an apparent non sequitur. The first is about a demonstration gone wrong. The speaker's mother is said to try to exhibit honesty, though she effectively does the opposite. He says that he gave her flowers in order to elicit from her a show of pleasure. He and his mother alike are concerned with shows, as the poem is. He judges her harshly for not standing closely by her own words, for speaking loosely to please another, which to him means she is without, without honor, as if she were bearing false witness. He speaks evasively of someone saying, your mother's a whore. His response to that offense, he laughed, you remember, indicates that his own sense of honor did not stir him to defend her, which means that she is not the only one whose honor is in question. Where the speaker refers to her, he reveals his own shame. His concern, I think, is with what he said in interrogation. This estrangement from his mother leads to a Tiresias moment as if he could be a Roman soldier as well as a New Yorker. The Roman Emperor Valerian ruled from 253 to 260. Uh, he was captured by his adversary, the Persian king Shapur I. Heck derives his poem from a contested historical account. The connection, one conjectures, between the two stories is torture. The analyst's end was subjected to verbal assaults at least your mother's a whore. This remark and the later one that, that mother ransomed me are the cruxes of my interpretation. They're small remarks, but it, I think they reveal something that's significantly missing. Hecht's speaker is in trouble. The analyst directs him repeatedly to calm down. The testimony he conveys to his analyst follows from the mother was a liar story. The analyst and says he was compelled to witness an atrocity. Milton, in the poem that I'm not going to discuss, speaks as a citizen who has only indirectly witnessed atrocities. Uh, presumably, he read or heard of them in a diplomatic con context. Milton was the, uh, the Foreign Secretary of England. In no sense was Milton incapacitated by the atrocities he talks about. 
um, as Hecht's speaker, was incapacitated by atrocities he identifies with Valerian. Milton's language indicates that what he read invigorated his judgment. He speaks intemperately, but claims no pathos for himself, nor is the pain and suffering endured by Valerian Hecht's main point. The Analysand speaks instead of the humiliations borne by Valerian, and they are a consequence of display. Valerian was exhibited alive and dead to crowds of observers. What Hecht's speaker does not divulge is his own testimony under interrogation. He says that he was ransomed by mother, which may be a veiled acknowledgement that, like his mother, he lied uh, to interrogators, uh, possibly about Valerian, as his mother lies in the first story. Toward the end of the poem, the narrative voice says, and with him passed away the honor of Rome. Defeat and death are not inherently dishonorable. Display is the source of dishonor. Feigning interest in what a tedious person says is not inherently dishonorable. But to display one's mendacity or to have others expose one's mendacity, these are inherently humiliating and dishonorable. He says five times that he was compelled to watch the torture of the emperor. And that is a sure sign of a problem with his testimony. Observers are distinguished from agents. He insists that he played no, role, no other role in the spectacle than that of being an observer. He only watched. For the suffering of Valerian, he, feels, he appears not to feel much anguish or, response, or any responsibility, or else to be fighting off such feelings. Being forced to see contradictions, one's own and those of others, that is one of the ends of, that are served uh, by testimony. The spectacle of public testimony forces others to see a wrong that they have not acknowledged. Your mother's a whore. That insult causes Hecht's speaker to see that his own origin is dishonorable, that he knew nothing of honesty. He is at a loss in a project of self-examination, such as psychoanalysis. To strip a prisoner of clothing or to put a collar and leash on him is an atrocity. But the real humiliation is the snapping of a photograph, for that is to ask to be known as one who degrades vulnerable people. The shame of this is suffered, too, by those who, may, who are made to view the photographs. For one must then acknowledge that people like oneself, one's countrymen or neighbors, sought to humiliate people in this way. Shapur I is referred to in the poem as the barbarian king. To the pseudo-Roman narrator, he is a foreigner. To Milton, Roman Catholics perpetrated an atrocity against the Waldensians. But to Hecht, writing as a former GI, not so long after the end of World War II, the barbarian king was a vile commander, like others in the then recent war. One realizes that many have abused prisoners, that this is one of the things that people in many places and times have wished to do to one another. Crowds love spectacles of torture. One thinks of medieval German paintings and of the US lynchings organized in advance and advertised as attractions. Hecht's one viewer, though, is disabled by shame. Given sufficient zeal and a lot of company, one may regard a denounced person as entirely other than oneself. Or one may suspect that one's own acts could be represented as shameful. What honor is there for those who think themselves immune to shame? Many wish even to see atrocities displayed to contaminate the self-approval of others. Then the king made a short speech to the crowds to which they responded with gasps of wild excitement. Milton, in, in his poem, he wants vengeance. The narrative voice of Hecht's poem has no comparable confidence. Milton's language is taught. Hecht's language is not. His form is a prosy free verse, accentual lines tending now and then toward iambic pentameter. And Hecht, 
was an, um, a metrically conservative poem. This style is exceptional for him. He evidently felt that in this poem, an array of lapses, of vacancies, is more appropriate than one of timed stresses and vowel matches, such as rhymes. This is a poem about what resists testimony, what does not get said, namely complicity. Heck's speaker has been overwhelmed by his putative experience of atrocity. Both poems dwell on severity. This is something that comes with the absence of a legal system. Testimony is meant to imitate one feature of a juridical system. I mentioned the contrast uh, at, the be at the beginning. Neither Milton nor Hecht orient their poems on protocols of justice. The absence of law pulls these poems towards severity. Offenses need to be very clear so that judgment can seem authoritative in the absence of juridical procedures. So clear that that absence seems immaterial and condemnation seems inevitable, natural. Testimony invokes some version of natural law or at least custom. This is why one wants testimony that is lurid. Milton and Hecht both provide that. The one who violates nature is commonly said to be a monster. Talk, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Laura Kipnis speaks of Harvey Weinstein in the, in the current issue of the New York Review of Books as a monster. It is encouraging to characterize one's adversaries as monstrous. One believes easily that one is not monstrous, that only a monster is monstrous. The rest of us are human, by which we mean attractive and complex. Isn't it just too comforting to say as well that our adversaries are, like Harvey Weinstein, fat and simple? Nothing human is alien to me, Terence wrote two millennia ago. The challenge of that view remains before one still, especially when one attends to testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we can open the panel for discussion. I would invite you for your questions. Yeah. We have one. J Yes, because uh, Leonard Baskin, I have, I'm happy to show you uh, some, some Leonard Baskin cartoons, um, uh, but I can't. Yeah, I, I know his work. Know I'm just they wondering are. if there's, yes. if so there's. They, Leonard Baskin is a master of the lurid and of horrible, horrible figures. And so he's, a, he's the perfect illustrator for Anthony Hecht and for Dante, say. Uh, and uh, and he and Hecht were friends and collaborated a number of times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If I can abuse the position, then I'm just going to jump with a question of my own. Uh, I have a question for Daniela first about your presentation and about maybe just to ask a little bit more about the discussion that you as a team had about the representation of uh, Afege and uh, patriarchs in relationship to, to Yugoslav, so Yugoslav socialist modernization and patriarchy. And my problem is that we, we have this easy sort of simplifications with, with understanding Balkans as patriarchal and then understanding the modernization process as the patriarchalization, which you already mentioned there. But, but I was just wondering how did you articulate these fine repatriarchalizations that socialist modernization brought? And you mentioned for, for shortly of violence. And what I see, for example, that pre-modern, uh, in, in terms of, of female bodies, pre-modern pre sort of society had some protection for female bodies in most banal sense women were not grabbed in, in public spaces, but after the so, uh, modernization, whatever modernization was there, female body and, and, and became much more endangered where, where like people, men, 
give themselves rights to, to in, invade female bodies. So my question is how socialist modernization as, as particular sort of modernization sort of brought new patriarchal. So, yeah. Socialist modernity brought... Uh, new patriarchal forms, or Well, it wasn't socialist modernity, it was ethnic nationalism. Uh, maybe I didn't make that clear. I mean, this is, you know, it's always difficult to say, okay, first we had this for 40 years, and then all of a sudden, just overnight, we became, uh, you know, how this process went along. I mean, it's a big question, and I don't, I'm not sure I can answer that question uh, right now because I can only speak from what my data and what my research uh, kind of revealed for me. Um, because when I analyze, I mean, uh, you know, I've analyzed media from the 40s, from the 60s, and contemporary stuff, and of course the representations are. And everything's different, you know. And it, you, you can't just say, oh, you, you, you can't either say, um, for instance, uh, patriarchy is this constant um, on the Balkans. There were moments when, uh, you know, for instance, discourse in the 60s in women's magazines was very, very different from both the 40s and... Uh, but you still can't hear me, can you? So it was very different. For instance, one um, in, in Nova Gen, uh, which is another magazine that I analyzed, the first, um, which again to me speaks as some sort of testament of what women before me thought, how they behaved, what lives they lived. For instance, women were talking about uh, when is going to be the end of a long and tedious working day. You know, they were discussing work, uh, children, uh, kindergartens, that kind of stuff. Like in the night, in post-socialist media for women, you won't find such narratives, you know. And the thing about the 40s and 45 and 46, uh, in the chapter, I didn't just analyze the media, but I compared, uh, uh, compared what was in, in Nova Zena with what, for instance, Nova Zena was trying to respond to. Because on the other hand, I analyzed minutes from meetings. For instance, you learn that in 1945, in 46, you still have women in Kiseljak, you have nuns who are against the party, the National Front. You have Chetniks around the villages of Kotorvaros. One would think that with the end of World War II that everything was over. So Nova Zena was responding to what I think was found on the ground, what seemed to be the real problems that women were facing on the ground, you know, and in the, F, uh, in the FHA archives, stuff that they found, for instance, how women were protesting that they've, um, that the party terminated aphasia, they called it aphasia. So there were many, many instances which tells us that this period is full of discontinuities that women were trying to address and uh, react proactively to the real problems on the ground because you know when you juxtapose uh, different materials from the archives with the, this actual text which is very propagandistic of course which constructs this new women, you know woman you find that you know these were actually their attempts to resolve the problems that they found during AFG meetings uh, talking to women from different villages etc cetera, etc cetera. So in this sense, you know, this is just a snippet of 1945, 1946. But to answer your question, I think it's a, it's a big one. And it requires, I think, you know, um, a lot more time. So I'm not able to perhaps answer it, to, to talk about these discontinuities, because it's such a broad, to me, it's just too broad. So, yeah. No? Uh, I have a question both for uh, Daniela and, and, and for Cornelia. Um, you know, uh, uh, even with the emancipation of, of women, like uh, uh, you, you can see again uh, women themselves, and, and and you saw it also in Israel. In the in the there was a, a protest movement against the uh, war in Lebanon uh, called Four Mothers, taking this uh, space uh, again of mothers, not. Uh, not the space of uh, of of, uh, of you know the universal uh, human being or uh, uh, you know the, the, the humanistic uh, idea of feel, uh, freedom, but uh, getting the legitimacy again from this let's say biological uh, 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 
uh, place or, or uh, let's say, uh, emotional space or something like that. With many times with no claim for, for this universality of uh, human freedom or uh, different discourse from, from, from the, let's say... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, 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 I, I mean, it's not only that, but it reappears even in the text that you were reading, mm -hmm. and, and in the in the poem or in the uh, uh, in the article that Cornelia uh, was was uh, mm -hmm. uh, saying. So uh, this is, I mean, I mean, uh, for me, wh why is it not, uh, especially if you were talking about the socialistic or communistic. Uh, uh, tradition that uh, that women don't uh, appropriate this kind of discourse of uh, I forgot to mention there is uh, an example here um, when, yes. when you know they're talking about the mother of Bahida Maglailic how Kadinitsa Kadia means uh, judge so Kadinitsa is his wife so how Kadinitsa Maglailic uh, starts dancing Kozorečko Kolo uh, and says, I have three of my children in the war, I have a red bleeding star under my heart, that kind of stuff. So there is this moment of motherhood that is always heroic. That moment of heroic motherhood we find in uh, another, uh, of course, in Stojanka Majka Knežokoljka by Skender Kulenović. And yesterday we were talking about Darko Cvjetić, and I warmly recommend to uh, non serbo croatian speaking audiences to read Darko Cvjetić's uh, poem, uh, The Contribution to the Skender Kulenović Award, in which he speaks, he confronts Stojanka, Majka Knežokoljka, so you know, the mother of Knežpolje, who lost three sons, you know, there's this epic moment there with uh, Mother Hava from Priedor, who lost sons. So she, he's trying to bring two perspectives, you know, together again. And this is why I think Darko Cvjetić is making this intervention. So yes, there is motherhood, ex except that I perhaps uh, failed to mention no, it. No, no, I know yeah. that, but, uh, yeah. but, but I think that... But it's heroic. It's always like victim sacrificing. It's, you know, I've given my children and then you have Diala who says, ne dam djecu za rat. You know, I won't give children. So yeah, yeah, it's an interesting motive. Yeah, but sure. you know, the, yeah. the question is why, yes, why, why all the time uh, uh, taking the legitimacy yeah. from that aspect and not, you know, because when we speak of testimony, many times we speak about this kind of, um, let's say it uh, simply kind of, freedom of speech or the, the, the ability of a, of a, a human, a person to articulate, articulate to, it, to, yeah. to gi give, in some way, testimony comes within the corpus uh, of a definition of the of humans, you know, if you talk about, you know, the definition of human can speak and think. And, uh, but this, uh, but the women take their legitimacy from a different way. Can I come in on that? Yeah, please. Okay, so um, that's a, it's a really good point um, because we could even argue that actually there's an element to that which is actually quite patri patriarchal, so which reinscribes a very patriarchal image of what it means to be a woman um, into the public space. So if women take their legitimacy from being mothers, then there is something there about well, the natural state of women is to have children, and those are the only women who have a right, sort of, to speak in public. Um, and actually, R Rivera doesn't do that because she is not there as a mother. Right. She is. I don't even know if if she has children. Yeah. Um, so she is there and she speaks about many, many different people, men and women. Um, who who have been killed, you know, who have been the victims of violence. So her position, and that to me is probably one of the most um, maybe significant elements of what she doing, what she's doing, is precisely to be there as a woman who puts her body into the public space and like really sort of puts it out there, yeah, mm -hmm. and sort of throws herself into the gesture of her speech and invites that resonance of other people. So Rivera's 
like that particular recital and also that poem, one of the interesting things that it does is that it precisely, I think, um, it acknowledges motherhood because mothers get mentioned in the poem, but there's so lots of other people um, who um, who are still searching, who have been lost, um, or who are who are grieving for their loved ones. So precisely what she does is to not do that. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and the other the other thing is that with that particular instance, with the movement for peace, with justice and dignity. Actually, who we have in the beginning of it is a grieving father, yeah, who basically comes into the public space to claim um, that, well, to claim that public role of a grieving father. And anecdotally, a lot of people who actually accompanied the caravanas of the movement for peace with justice and dignity said that one of the most um, remarkable things was how many men. Um, came out there and cried in public and um, and expressed sort of their grief and put themselves out there as as grieving cousins, fathers, brothers, uh, friends, um, or simply as as a person in solidarity and someone who was um, affected not through a personal, family-based way, but because um, all those dead are ours. Yes. So, and actually, I think from there we could actually take a lot of inspiration, um, and to to move away from that notion of it's only families who, who grieve. So, of course, someone who will have known a person intimacy intimately will have that person as sort of an everyday feature in their everyday lives who have a different experience of loss and grief than someone who doesn't have that experience of that particular person. Yeah. But what happened there was actually that those different kinds of griefs were sort of mutually supportive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and in that regard, it's pro it was probably also a movement that drew on a lot of anti-patriarchal activism, which had gone on, especially in the north of the country, in the connection with the femicides. Because the femicides were very often um, assassinations of women who didn't fit the mold, whichever that may have been, um, that would have been cut out for them. And who were therefore vulnerable and were therefore, um, well, um, and ended up being killed. Or disappeared, yeah, and adopt the victims of enforced disappearance. Um, so that's that's that was quite a powerful tradition that that also um, came into that, and and maybe that is something that um, that sort of we could all take when we look at testimony to not only look at the family, but to sort of broaden it out as well to not only look at mothers, to not only look at wives, um, but to also sort of have the fathers there, have the cousins, have friends have a community. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, Cornelia, may I ask you um, to say something about the economics of the assassinations uh, and uh, the violence that's depicted in the poem? Um, there's uh, about, I, hadn't, I wish I had seen the poem in, in, in advance, but uh, so I have only superficial acquaintance with it, but it's about line 15, it says, there they come, those who got lost somewhere in Tamoli, Tamoli, Tamo, Tamoli Pass, I can't, sorry. But um, my understanding uh, from the representations of the violence in Mexico, and my understanding is not, it is simply what one sees in films and what one reads in American newspapers and so forth, uh, is that the violence is all tied up with the drug cartels and with the drug trade. And um, that is to say with economics. And when you said, um, I, I couldn't hear everything you said just on technical, for technical reasons, but you said something about the U.S. assisting uh, the, the drug cartels or assisting something. And, and I agree with you uh, that the assistance that is given is that the drug trade is drawing on people who take drugs, illicit drugs, in America. Uh, that is why, that is what is at the base of all of this. And yet, 
uh, and yet there's very little, there's very little uh, effort, I think, to, uh, in, to enforce among the American population responsibility for what is going on for this kind of violence. The, the, the drug economy, the consumption of drugs in America is not confined to the right or the left. Uh, and it is not analyzed that way at all. It's enormous. And without it, this would not be happening. Um, but it isn't. Uh, so I think, that, I think of the responsibility as being with every person who participates in the contraband economy in America, and there's so many people who do that. I don't think of it as a state responsibility primarily of the U.S., though I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm sure that the U.S. state does does uh, does destructive things uh, in regard to it, but it's really coming from people like us, you know, who like to use drugs, uh, and uh, that's what's at the base of this, and I, as I understand it. And I didn't get a full representation of that from the poem. Do you have a sense of of, of does that figure into your analysis of the poem? So, I, I don't know that I could hear all of the question. I answered what I could hear and then maybe you could follow up on it. So, yes, of course, um, all this is related to the consumption of drugs in the United States and in other places. It is also related to the structures of money laundering. Yeah? If, if, if illicit money couldn't be laundered, um, then, um, then Probably um, it would be a much less um, attractive, um, sort of um, much less attractive to engage in the, in these sorts of sorts of activities. Now, that particular okay. So, um, the U.S. What I refer to was that the U.S. gave significant amount of training on of military aid. Um, to like all the all the wars on drugs that have gone on in, in Central America and South America, um, but also to the Mexican government and the Mexican military, in part and in, in, through the Merida Initiative and, and other initiatives. Now, um, basically, what you could look at is that in Mexico you have different types of violence which are escalating at the same time, and which are. Um, in that particular form, probably very much linked to the neoliberalization of the country since 1994. That is not to say that there weren't any um, organ that there wasn't organized crime before that. Yeah, there was, but it worked in a different way. Um, what happened, um, and and I'm I'm just going to talk about this a little bit because because actually this is a huge subject and we could have several lectures just on that. Um, but um, um, but what so what Rivera talks about in the poem are several types of violence um, which are all exploding at the same time in a context um, where the social fabric has been eroded um, by a number of policies over time. Yeah? So part of the reason why. Um, <clears throat> why organized crime could take hold in the way in it, that it did was actually related to other policies which facilitated that or which removed other parts of the economy that people had relied on before. Yeah? So, so, for example, agricultural subsistence economy. So agricultural subsistence. Those people who then no longer could live off them um, either migrated to the cities or migrated to the U.S. or they became, in other reason, for other reasons, when they stayed where they were, um, much more vulnerable um, to offers of organized crime, for example, to grow drugs or to smuggle them or whatever. So it is not, um, I mean, my understanding of the representation of that in the U.S. is that maybe a little bit one-dimensional. Yeah? And while the consumption of drugs is, is certainly plays a role in that, it is actually a much more complex picture. Now, what happened with the war on drugs was that, bef well, um, the drug, the so-called drug cartels actually started fighting each other over their territories. 
Yeah? And the so-called war on drugs was then called to intervene into that fight um, through sort of militarizing um, parts of the, of, the, of the security forces. Um, but what they, um, but what then also happened was that um, in that in that context, um, others, other people, like for example, social movements, um, individuals who were in some way considered deviant and so on, were also targeted. Yeah. So it's. I mean, basically, I think what we have is an under. There's an understanding of of the of the state, which says we will give the state military aid to intervene into um, into organized crime. But what that doesn't necessarily take into account is that um, official structures um, and authorities and organized crimes crime structures are imbricated in such a way that they are sometimes um, ident well that that they certainly work with each other or sometimes are identical with each other yeah so in that regard it's a much more complex picture and someone would say actually you have to think about there's like two different wars going on at the same time and they are intertwined yeah and there's probably so there's the war between the so -called cartels and then there's the war by the state against uh, against all sorts of other people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so it is not it is not only about consumption. It is not only about money laundering. All that plays an important role. Um, but what it really is is a compounding of several types of violence um, on a ground where um, where the social where people have tried to erode the social factors and um, and parts of the economy over long over a long period of time and what Rivera actually does in the poem is um, if you really go into the detail of it then she um, has examples of those you could call them those different killing fields of, of that violence yeah so for example the femicides that she refers to in the north of the country, those are very often associated with the neoliberalization um, of the north of the country, um, which created, uh, together with with um, patriarchal um, with a, with a patriarchal hegemony, which then made these women very vulnerable. So she actually looks at lots of different killing fields in that poem. I didn't have time to go into all of them in detail. Does Thank that you. answer the question? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. Okay, for Bob. Um, thank you for the poem and my humble reading um, and thinking a lot. I, I, I like that it's from the distant past because we, we can um, uh, afford this distance so we, we can have, we can uh, face kind of ontological anxiety that comes from this poem because in a way perpetrator actually controls bystander and victim he controls, it's, it controls everything, and um, it's a kind of paradigm of our era as well. Because we are fascinated by the violence, and we are watching it on TV, magically, Syria, Bosnia, whatever, and whatever comes next, unfortunately. And um, it's a humiliation position. Like you said, he only watched. We are only watchers, which is a position of testimony and of participating in a violence because we are not doing anything about it but still it's for still maybe it's better position than looking away or it's not i'm not sure but thank you for this uh, thank yeah. you yes that's in, that's an interesting question what if we looked away from uh, from representations, uh, from repre from extreme representations of uh, of violence, what would that do uh, for uh, the film industry? Say, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. 
thank you. I would thank our panelists and close the session. Noah, what time should we get back here? Uh, I think in half an hour. What's it? Maybe 12.30? Uh, 12.30, yes. Yeah. All right, thank you then.